than you might think, because Simon Ochsenreiter is the most uh, humble man in the Scala community. And as it turns out, there is very little known about this man. So I, instead of, uh, I mean, I tried, of course, to do my research and my due diligence online. I even talked to him personally and asked him, Simon, how do you want to be introduced? And uh, he told me basically something that apparently he told somebody else too, who tried to do the same thing. And he said, who I am or what I do doesn't matter. So, <laughs> great. So what I did was during lunch, I walked around and I asked everybody among you, uh, do you know Simon Ochsenreiter? And the few who said yes, um, I asked them, well, tell me about him. And so here's a little collage of uh, what the community thinks of Simon Ochsenreiter. Uh, he's a master student in computer science in Karlsruhe. He is the number four in number of bug reports, not fixes, on uh, <laughs> Escala. He is uh, very active on the mailing list. Uh, I heard he has a beard. He, <laughs> he's a visionary. Um, and somebody said he lives very close where I live. You, uh, you can't talk to him before his talk. You have to ask him after. This was because I told him that I needed to introduce him. So uh, I'll ask you how to introduce you after the talk, and then maybe we can do it again. Um, he sees issues one or two years before they, anyone else sees them. And uh, he's really, really long and a very active member of the core community. He doesn't shy away from conflict, and uh, as long as he has a vision, he doesn't even shy away from conflict with the gods, literally. <laughs> so he's very influential, and his name means bull rider, so... <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, a warm applause for Simon Ochsenreiter. Okay, so this is better? Okay, right. Yeah, it's like I try this one first until I break it. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to Chris and my talk. Um, I'm probably far from the most qualified person in this room to give the talk, but I'll try anyway. Uh, I picked some short examples uh, where it's not really about uh, what I'm doing, but how I'm doing it, or how you could do the same. So it's there are, uh, as far as I could uh, make them, there are easy examples, there are short examples of hacking Scala C or of uh, like fixing a small bug in Scala C. Um, I'm not using any fancy bugs ex except Eclipse, and I think this will be my biggest issue today, but uh, I'll try not to crash Eclipse too hard. Um, I cut some corners, so um, if I show you uh, compilation before, compilation afterwards, I'm using pre-compiled binaries because if I tried to uh, run Eclipse and Scala C live during uh, coding, uh, we would have to wait a half an hour. So um, yeah, yeah it's, let's just uh, start working and skip talking. <laughs> so uh, the first thing is like, which I wanted to look at is uh, view bounds. So uh, some time ago, um, everyone agreed, well, view, view bounds in the language, like this uh, uh, less than percentage uh, sign and were, in the, were not the best thing, and maybe we should get uh, rid of it. And that's actually like a nice idea because context bounds are much better, but the problem is we can't just remove the, re remove the operator because people use it and it will break all over the place. So uh, what we could, could do instead is just add some uh, warning to the compiler so that every, every time somebody uses this operator, uh, he gets uh, a warning. Um, 
we also put this warning behind another flag so uh, that we don't disturb people with deprecation warnings until our rewriting tools are ready. So we don't want people to uh, rewrite er the, the whole uh, source code themselves, but we just want to provide a tool and that tool is not ready yet. So the deprecations won't show up by default. And what we are seeing uh, with this bug fix is uh, how to do some simple changes in the parser, because that's all what it would take in the simplest case, uh, how to emit warnings in Scala-C and how to use uh, settings in Scala-C, which are basically the representation of uh, user-definable settings or commando fl uh, fl uh, flags to Scala-C. Okay, let's do this. Um, I basically uh, took the Scala source code uh, and um, ported every bug fix to the 2.11 branch and reversed it so it could look slightly different on GitHub, but it's more or less the same. So um, the first thing, we want to fix view bounds. And actually, uh, I don't have any idea where it could be except like somewhere in the parser. So let's have a look at Scala compiler. So compiler, where are you, parser? All right, there is the parser. And because we have absolutely no idea um, what we should do, let's just search for it. All right. No, I'm pretty. Yeah, I used IntelliJ once and now I've forgotten everything. Oh, you're saving me. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so well, uh, let's just uh, search for view bound and just figure out if this helps us in any kind. OK. Um, OK, let's reload this and try again. OK, we found something. And what the hell? OK, so uh, we have found three matches, but the first one looks, uh, looks pretty good. So what we see here in the compiler source is that there that there is uh, a token for view bound, and that's a good thing. So we don't need to mess with the with token, or we don't need to wait until things are type checked. We have a token for view bound right there, and it's probably fine enough. And the parser is just reading uh, a token, and it says, well, in token view bound, and well, we probably want to uh, emit a deprecation message for every time we hit a view bound. So, yeah, let's just try auto completion. Night froze. Ah, oh, yeah, here we go. So, uh, one thing we have to provide is an offset. So, have a look. I'm always for, I always forget what, uh, where, uh, which things have an offset, but it looks like the, the input itself has an offset. This should be fine. And as a message, we might say, uh, well, um, new bounds are deprecated. Please use um, an implicit parameter instead. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, so we added the deprecation warning, but now the deprecation warning would trigger, trigger every time without uh, any kind of additional flag. And one flag which is quite useful in, in Scala C is the future flag, which basically says, um, I have some special behavior, but it's not ready yet for, what's, for what reason doesn't matter. But I want to provide it for people who opt into this flag. And this is the, this flag is basically represented in this, is uh, accessible with the with, uh, settings. Settings basically holds all the flag, hold, holds all the settings for, which can be defined by the user and some others and also stores things like defaults or permissible values or did the user set this flag or was this flag already set to this value by default and stuff like that. So what we want to do now is, uh, is ask, well, if setting future is set, then we want to uh, emit the, the deprecation warning and otherwise we'll just do nothing. So and uh, now I'm just, um, picking a random newer Scala version than what we had here. And let's just uh, try this. All right, yes, I'll increase the font size. All right, so we have like like a, some random uh, view bounds, take some other parameters and do something. And as we see, uh, if we haven't enabled future, we don't get any error message. But if we run uh, Scala with the uh, future flag, <coughs> The com okay, let's, uh, if we run the compiler with the future flag and deprecation. <laughs> we see that the compiler yells at us. Probably. It's not actually your code that's taking so long there. It's actually the compiler that's starting. Yeah, it's like the, the, the Scala. <laughs> REPL needs a bit of time to initialize, to initialize everything. But yeah, sure. So we see that uh, actually we got this uh, multiple times, but it's just on the REPL because the REPL does some, uh, I think, does some special wrapping around the code and it triggers it multiple times. OK, so that's our first bug fix. It only uh, included touching the parser, so it's very early in the compilation phase and it's, it was like, pretty straightforward. So just a simple texture search helped us. And uh, just uh, what's also nice, if you even if you don't uh, plan to hack on Scala C, it's always nice to read the comments because it's like, it's, sometimes it's easy to tell who wrote a comment and this comment was written by Paul Phillips because of this thing here. This straight and similar ones for scanners represents the beginnings of a campaign against this latest incursion by Cutty McPastington and his army of very similar soldiers. <laughs> so that's, that's obviously Paul Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this... <laughs> so, and uh, just uh, to, uh, to uh, finish this uh, change, um, every change to language needs to be accompanied, accompanied by uh, tests and every kind of uh, semantic behavior of a test has, uh, has some kind of special directory. For instance, we have the test files NEC directory, <laughs> which says, well, I have some, some code which looks like Scala, but the compiler shouldn't compile it. And basically it's negative tests the test only goes green if the compiler rejects the code. And yeah, so we have like a file dot flags. We say, well, minus dep deprecation, minus x future. And to actually make the compiler fail, we add minus x fatal warnings, which turns deprecation warnings into errors. 
and now we have a nice negative check for our change. And that's it. So. So then the next uh, thing we will look at is, is deprecating inheritance and deprecating overriding. And the basic issue is that sometimes adding a deprecated annotation is just too uh, unspecific. It's just too general. Sometimes you have classes where using the class is fine, but, uh, but inheriting from the class is not fine. Or in some cases we have a method and we have forgotten to add a final modifier to the method and now people have like extended the class and have overridden the method and we're now we're stuck because we can't just uh, make the method final without breaking people's code. And the deprecated inheritance and deprecated overriding annotations are solutions for these kind of problems because we can give users very specific uh, information about what's wrong with their code and how to fix it without annoying them in the general case. So um, what's, what we're looking at uh, uh, in this uh, bug fix are names in the compiler. So how do we represent like an annotation or how do we represent the name of like string or Java line object or stuff like this. We look at imaging warnings again. We look a bit at a ref check phase, which basically uh, does some common sense checks, like um, I have a member here and the member in the parent class, is this actually valid? Is this overriding things correctly? And also we we'll look at the type of phrase. So. What is it called? No, um, what's the opposite of stash? <laughs> All right, just because uh, there is some custom Eclipse configura configuration behind this, and if I stash everything, things will be broken. All right. So um, we uh, again, we have actually no idea how to approach this. So let's do some search first. So um, first, we should actually add annotations. So we just enter the, the library part of the Scala compiler and scroll to the Scala package and I've already added these files. So basically uh, deprecated annotation. Looks like this, it's just a single line, it's uh, deprecated inheritance. It takes uh, two arguments, a message and since when it's deprecated and it extends uh, static annotation and deprecated overriding is uh, basically the same. So there's not mu much magic going on in uh, static annotation. So the first thing we want to do is actually make those uh, annotations known to the compiler so that we can refer to them uh, without like requiring or computing uh, those uh, definitions every time. So. So I look here into just 
just look for my special marker. All right. So we have a lot of um, definitions and uh, annotations in the compiler are called attributes, but that's basically it. So uh, what we want to do, maybe just copy that in because it's not really exciting. It's just, so basically we are just adding a new name, deprecated inheritance attribute and deprecated overriding attribute and say, well, we require the class scala punct, uh, dot deprecate inheritance and scala deprecate overriding. And if the class is not there, we will fail and we will know that some things went wrong. So um, next, um, we should add some convenience methods for these checks to a symbol. Um, symbol is basically the API for everything symbol related in Scala. And it would be nice if we could just ask, hey, symbol over there, do you have an annotation? And if yes, uh, well, what's your message? And maybe uh, Yeah, I probably just copied this. So I promised live coding. I have to apologize a bit. Um, I'm running a, a bit behind time, so I have to hurry up and get things done. So um, we just added some convenience uh, methods. Has deprecated inheritance, which returns true or false, and uh, a deprecated inheritance message, which basically gives us an optional string if the user defined one. Uh, so we can also uh, uh, basically get the message that the user uh, employed to tell us what's wrong with inheriting or overriding a method. Okay, so now we still don't know where to fix things actually. So um, one approach uh, which you can take is to say, well, um, let's try something related where I know the, uh, uh, where, where I know where to where to search. So maybe um, let's check for let's check uh, let's figure out the right place for deprecated overriding first. So um, something similar to this deprecated overriding annotation is maybe um, extend uh, overriding a class, but for getting the override uh, annotation. So let's just define a class like this. So this is not really valid code, but we get a nice error message. So we see needs override modifier, and uh, this is probably something we can work with because we know the place where this error message is emitted is probably also the right place to add our own check. So let's just use this. Okay, so we are basically in a place where a lot of checks are done uh, regarding members of types. So there's like checking whether um, we are extending from class or trade or if something is uh, final, if we can't override a method, etc. So maybe just add a check for our own thing here, so we we'll want to add a check, uh, override deprecated method, and let's just jump to the proposed definition. So, okay. So what do we want to check with this override, uh, check over, override deprecated annotation? So if um, we want to check um, if the, um, if, the um, uh, if the parent class 
has uh, so the other um, uh, has this deprecated error overriding annotation and um, some additional um, and basically we ask has this member this deprecated overriding annotation and are some other things false so basically this is not really interesting but it reduces unnecessary uh, deprecation warnings a lot so basically we say we don't want to warn if there's an override annotation and if we are already in some kind of deprecated situation or if there is some kind of bridge annotation which we probably didn't generate our own so it, we try to not warn inside deprecated code and inside synthetic code which like kind of makes sense and if we see that uh, our uh, if the member of our parent, parent class has this deprecated overriding annotation, uh, we just uh, assemble the, the message and that's basically it. Um, we could uh, do the same approach with, uh, over, uh, with uh, the deprecated inheritance annotation where we first uh, um, basically take a root like Final class foo uh, class bar extends foo and then just search for the error message again and then we are more or less at the right place. So if you if you want to add some warnings or some uh, deprecations, that's often uh, a really nice and naive and uh, simple approach to find the right place where to change things. <laughs> But uh, I think I'll skip a uh, deprecated uh, inheritance because we don't have so much time. All right. Um, so, are there any questions yet? Or did I just. No, I don't do that either. Oh, I'll try to. Didn't do it. And uh, some examples for the deprecated uh, inheritance and overriding use cases are, for instance, classes like big decimal and big int, which should have been final, but uh, people forgot it or it wasn't planned like this. And now we uh, could just add the deprecated inheritance annotation, and people got the warning and could stop extending big int or big decimal, and later the class can be made final. And today, big int and big decimal, uh, decimal are actually final. So it has kind of worked out well. So uh, some time ago, or I think a month uh, ago on the mailing list, uh, somebody said, well, uh, the way uh, Scala C uh, rewrites a string concatenation like foo plus bar is really, really slow because the JVM uh, just puts an, uh, the additional optimizations on the way Java does these optimizations. So Java basically creates a new string builder and calls append and to string. And Scala does basically the same, but, use it, but it uses uh, their own wrapper. So Scala uses Scala.collection.mutable.stringbuilder, and this string builder is just a wrapper for the java.lang.stringbuilder uh, class, but it confuses the JVM optimization. And the goal of this patch is just to make uh, Scala C use String Builder and really look a bit up, uh, uh, into rewriting ASTs and how to emit, uh, how to emit bytecode with the Gen B code phase, which is the newest backend. 
And yeah, basically this was the email we got. And yeah, three times, being three times slower, doing the same thing uh, as Java is probably not uh, an, acceptable, uh, an acceptable situation. So we just needed to fix that. <laughs> Okay, so what we know is we're working on the back end, so we don't need to search everywhere, so we know back end is the right place. So let's just search for our slow Scala dot, dot uh, oh, maybe just um, maybe just search for the um, internal uh, name. Um, this should probably be enough because we're working not on classes anymore, or on types anymore, but on on uh, on Java class file-like entities, and there are uh, everything which is a dot is basically replaced by uh, by slashes. So and yeah, we see our first case. So we define like some string builder class name and the string builder class name is scala.collection.mutable.stringbuilder. And we of course don't want that. So let's just call it a Java string builder class name and do, uh, let's just do it this way and just see which things fall apart. <coughs> Okay, so here is basically the implementation of our old optimization. So we basically have a gen start concat, gen string concat, and a gen end concat, which does the magic of rewriting a string plus string to string builder dot append. And yeah, just add, let's just use a new name here, a new name here. So basically we see here at the start of each optimization, we basically call the constructor of the Java string builder class name with uh, the nullary constructor. And a bit later, we uh, have a look at what's the actual argument we want to concatenate to our string uh, here, do some uh, build a method with the result of that uh, computation. And then we basically invoke the string builder append method. And um, we need to change this. We also need to change this one here. OK, here's it again. OK, and at the end of our rewrite, we basically be calling the toString method, which returns the string. OK, this looks fine. So we still need to change this, but we just we just follow this because now we know where we need to change our next piece of code. So now we are in core B types, which is basically um, the uh, view um, at the back end or ASM the Java bytecode emitter has on these uh, types and. They're a bit cached because it isn't. so now we have these double indirection thingies here with core B type. And of course, this also doesn't exist. So we jump here and also add this one here. Add this here. This also doesn't exist. And now we are also back in known territory because now we're back in definitions. So let's just add a new class to uh, Java string builder class. Don't forget uh, to actually change this back here because otherwise the whole change wouldn't do anything. And Okay, so compiling, sync compiling. Now we can go to our original file where the reward is happening and just use a Java string builder reference for that. And if we uh,
if we uh, had a look at, uh, at the string builder Java doc, we see there are a lot of uh, overloads. So we could actually optimize our our check here a bit and not only uh, check for, well, is it an array or is it a class, but we could also add checks for like, is this another string builder or is this a string or another uh, char sequence and this patch to uh, this overload directly instead of just choosing object reference or a primitive uh, reference. This would be a bit faster because one method in direction less than a bit, uh, um, a bit less uh, indirection uh, with two calling two strings on things which are already more or less strings. So basically, this is what a rewritten code would look like. We okay, now it hangs. Yeah. Why are you doing this in the back end? That is the free transformation. <laughs> well, that's a There's good no question. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's always a, a question whether uh, whether you're trying to do more like uh, more large scale fixes or small scale fixes. And I, in this case, I actually think it's probably a good idea to wait until uh, a later phase because it's just an optimization where it's like, I, it's just like, it doesn't make much sense having, having this optimization uh, uh, through earlier phases. So I want to have the, the string concatenation. I want to keep this kind of a representation as long as possible before I optimize it. And maybe there will be other backends where this optimization doesn't apply. So yeah. But it's like I just took the existing code and tried to make it a bit better and not to break more stuff than I was fixing. So, yeah. Yeah, so basically, instead of the, uh, of the old check for is array or is object, I just, you could add another uh, bunch of checks for like, is this a string or is this a char, str uh, char string buffer or a char sequence and stuff like this. But yeah, it's. Fine, either way. Yep. So now we've uh, worked a bit in the back end. It's just. So how much time have you left? <laughs> Actually none. Well then, just let's just uh, pick a nice one. It's like, yeah, I had prepared some other examples, but I wasn't really sure how much time I would need. Okay, so let's take uh, parameter names. Yeah. Did you actually do some None at all. <laughs> it's like <laughs> no. It's just. Uh, it's just. I saw it. That uh, um, I saw the the person claiming it and uh, followed like the documentation and the links. And there is an actual JVM flag, something like a plus x uh, string opt or something like this, which actually just pattern matches on actual uh, on string builder invocations. So and it's basically it's like. I, if people say you're not doing it like Java, and if you're doing it like Java, it will be faster, I'll just believe them because that's usually the case. The JVM is just optimized for the thing Java C emits, and if there is no cost attached to it, like in this case, you don't see the change at all, uh, I'll just do it and be done. So, so the, the last thing I want to Present. Yes. 
are uh, support for Java 8 parameter names. So basically, uh, in Java 8, uh, the class files get another attribute uh, to store names of parameters. And the nice things is that these names are actually uh, accessible from, for instance, reflection. So in Java 8, we could ask the class long, well, get me the method re uh, reverse, and now get me the parameters of reverse, and now give me the first ones, so like that, parameters.head. And now I get uh, the type, uh, an instance of type char.lang reflect parameter, and it says, well, the first parameter to the method is long arc zero. And we see that, yes, we can get the method parameter names for methods, but they are, in this case, generic because uh, the standard by library of Java itself is not uh, compiled with this change. So um, if you want to have uh, your real parameter names available, you need to pass minus parameters to your Java C installation. And the goal of this change is that uh, Scala should also be able to read these attributes from the class files and also emit them uh, itself to be, to be a good citizen in the, in the JVM ecosystem and probably beat uh, Java on this feature. And uh, we'll just uh, look shortly into how we parse Java class files in Scala C, uh, how we translate from Java flex to Scala flex, and maybe if you have, if you are not completely running out of time, you're looking at uh, the SM to generate bytecode. All right. So um, the thing is that uh, there are multiple ways to get ASTs into Scala C. One case is, of course, um, Scala source code. Another case is Java class files and Java source code. So to see how we pass uh, Java class files, we have to go into the class file parser. Scala thingy and yeah here we basically uh, parse all the attributes for uh, for uh, from our uh, class file and we could just uh, add our own for instance I've prepared this here we can just parse uh, our method parameters attribute um, and go through uh, uh, the JVM uh, structure and retrieve these uh, uh, flags from uh, from the class file. So basically, what we're doing here is uh, is a bit of magic, but we're more or less following the JVM spec, which just says, well, this attribute is this large, and the name is stored somewhere else, and we just look it up, and that's basically it for reading it and uh, for writing it. It's uh, we we jump into the into our backend again, and let's just have a look. JVM backend. This is in B code helper. All right, so um, basically the AS, ASM jar, which is a basic, uh, an, um, third party jar file to emit class files, um, it, it implements a visitor pattern and we just call our own methods whenever we, visitor, we, whenever we visit parameter names. And here for every, um, for every, we get the method and we get our parameters and for every parameter, we just, uh, we just uh, visit our parameter and just uh, put our name into it and add the access files, which is basically uh, information about is the parameter final or was the parameter generated by compiler, etc. And well, that's basically it. Um, thanks all for having so much uh, 
time with me. Um, if you're interested, I still have some examples left, but have a nice time, have fun. Yeah.